everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Female Film Critics panel. And this is so exciting today. We have one of the film critics for the New York Times with us. Alyssa Wilkinson is here. And Alyssa, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Of course. I'm so glad I could. Yeah. Yeah. And so this is your first time on the show. So we like to give our guests a chance to introduce themselves and tell us a a little bit about uh, how you got inspired on this journey to become a critic. How how did it all start? (laughs) <laughs> it's a very long very winding story but I'll try to keep it uh reasonable which is that I didn't grow up um really with like film or from film criticism being a part of my life we were uh-huh. readers in my family um but I hadn't watched a lot of movies seriously until really after college I um didn't study writing or anything like that and so I started kind of writing as a side gig um, after college, I was sort of bored at my corporate job and didn't really have anything else to do. And I was getting interested in the ways that things like movies, which to me had always seemed like, you know, it's just like a light entertaining thing um, could actually be approached seriously and with interest and um, really becoming immersed in that world. And I had moved to New York city. Of course we have incredible repertory theaters here. And so you can get a film education very quickly. Um, And I also was writing about television and books and art and, you know, whatever else I could get someone to let me write about. Um, And there's a whole long series of day jobs and master's degrees and things like that that happened in the meantime. But along those, you know, all that time, so for about, I guess, 10 or 11 years, I was freelancing Um, and building a portfolio from really very small clips at small sites um, to and magazines which some of which were still printed on paper back then Um, and then you know started working into larger outlets like Vulture or Rolling Stone and those kinds of outlets Um, sometimes writing reviews but you know if you're a freelancer a lot of your work is often in um writing think pieces and features and things like that yeah exactly so I did a lot of that while um working at a series of nonprofits. I also uh, taught college for a really long time and then in 2016 I was hired at vox.com vox with a b um to write about film the site was two years old at that time and they had a small culture department but they didn't have anyone who specifically focused on movies so my job there was movies and then sometimes other things as they came up and um it's a very interdisciplinary place and I was there until last year um and the job opened up at the times when A.O. Scott moved over to the book review and so uh after a very long interview process (laughs) a very long interview process um, which is just par for the course here. Yeah. Uh, I got the job and I started last November. So I am one of, so Manola Dardis is the lead critic and I'm the other critic. Um, and then I've been here ever since. And it's That's a really good so job. so inspiring that, yeah. yeah, that you, because a lot of times, obviously they come up through like a journalism track, but yeah. to come up through like the freelancer track, which is what I connect with, yeah. And, and and I I totally relate to everything you're saying about doing a million different jobs and having a million mm-hmm. balls in the air and and uh yeah. yep yep yeah. and even still you know I'm adjuncting I'm teaching uh-huh. um courses at the Center for Fiction in Brooklyn and just you know journalism isn't it isn't lucrative even at its sure. highest levels but right. um but but you know it's been I always, um, when I would teach criticism or journalism, would tell my students that, you know, I'd never, until I started at the New York Times, literally, I always had a day job that was um, my stable base so that I could pay my rent and all that good stuff. When you got the, the, the job, you must have freaked out. (laughs) <laughs> well I mean it had been six months of interviews at that yeah. point so I was I was really just like oh good okay Gosh. finally um but I also I had been teaching full-time I was a full-time associate professor at a college down uh-huh. in downtown Manhattan and it was closing yeah. at the same time last year so there was a lot of uncertainty for about I remember six months that when that happened yeah, yeah so that was not um that was not a ton of fun it was a big relief when I got this job because I knew that 
you know, it was, uh, it was sufficient, um, resource wise on top of everything else, which is such a rarity in that's media so at this cool. point. That's, that's so cool. I love yeah. hearing that. Well, so I, what was you, what would you say was your like first introduction to film? Did you, you have a film that mm-hmm. you like was the first one you really fell in love with? Yeah, I mean, when I was a kid, the movies that I saw were ones that I had like checked out of the library and they were often um like, you know, Hitchcock, that kind of oh, okay. um older films and I didn't know what they were. <laughs> really I just you know there was like a small selection and I just saw some of those but it wasn't it wasn't anything that made a huge impression on me um Uh and it really wasn't until after college I had just moved to the city and I went I was living a few blocks from film forum down in the village and I went for a I went to see um Cache Michael Hanukkah's film which is Mm -hmm. um I guess a little Hitchcockian now that I think about it, but you know, it's a very, it's a thriller. It's, um, it, it's quite frightening in places, but, um, you know, what really made an impression on me was the first few minutes of the movie. You sort of initially think you're just watching people walking around outside a house. Like that's the movie. And then, um, a couple minutes into it, you sort of suddenly realize you're watching footage of those people walking around and that footage has been delivered to them. So they have been like surveilled by somebody they don't know who it is. And that's where the story kind of kicks off. Um, And I had never thought of a movie as being able to make you think about watching, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. You know, I think a lot of people approach movies as, oh, these people are like acting out a story for us and we're watching the story and we're like judging the story. And this was a whole different animal. Um, And (laughs) that movie ends ambiguously. There were like a lot of things that I really wasn't accustomed to because I didn't, I wasn't very sophisticated as a film viewer. Um, And that really, I thought, oh my gosh, I could talk about this movie for hours and just like think about all the things it means. And that was, that you know, that's how you become a critic. So Mm -hmm. Uh, that wasn't the only one the other one that like really sticks in my mind is I think it was that fall or that winter at Lincoln Center they did a um, series that was all of the films of Krzysztof Kieslowski and to be honest I'm not sure why they were doing it then (laughs) Uh, but I went and I saw those films for the first time and um, when I saw Three Colors Blue in particular Uh, I think it really opened up my eyes to how elements of production in that one color and music. um, That's my favorite of the three. I don't really like the white one. I don't like, I don't like that one. It's a very different movie. I mean, but I, I just love that. um, You know, I was realizing that you could tell a story with more than just the plot. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And again, that's not necessarily a way that if you, you know, weren't lucky enough to take film studies courses or something. It's just not something that necessarily enters your yeah. consciousness. So, yeah. That's so I cool. often think of those two as being origin stories for yeah, me. Yeah, that's cool. I love that. Mm-hmm. I love that. Well, I noticed that you have several books on your website. I saw that that mm-hmm. you have one on Joan Didion. That is, is that coming right? out in oh, March. Coming out. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So we're in the throes of. I I had a marketing meeting today about it actually, but wow. Um, yeah that's um so is it about movies made on her books or what um so those are involved so the the concept of it was to write kind of a cultural biography which is not to say a biography of Didion because there is one and it's very good Mm -hmm. um but rather to think about how you know so Didion was a Hollywood figure he was kind of a well-known she and her husband John Gregory Dunn were well-known screenwriters um and script doctors one of their produced screenplays yeah one of their produced screenplays for instance was um the Barbara Streisand Star is Born they wrote that that Chris Christopherson was in who just passed away um they also wrote The Panic at Needle Park which is um one of um well it's just an incredible incredible movie um you know they did adapt their own uh books but uh that 
I would say is not their better work, <laughs> but they also huh. just did what a lot of people did at the time in Hollywood and still do, which is make a living by fixing other people's screenplays. So they were real figures in Hollywood. Um, and, you know, their uh, John's nephew is um, Griffin Dunn, the actor and Griffin's father, Dominic was a major TV figure who turned into a celebrity journalist for Vanity Fair. That family is very embedded in show business, but also it was really interesting to me to look at the life and work of Joan Didion as it intertwines with Hollywood history. Like, for instance, one of her most formative influences was John Wayne. So thinking about how his kind of work and his world intertwines with hers. And even in the 80s, when she and John moved back from L.A. to New York, they she became a political journalist but if you read her political journalism in the late 80s up through the early aughts it's basically about america's political system going hollywood <laughs> um you know she she had no use for ronald reagan for instance for a lot of mm -hmm. reasons that had to do with hollywood as much as anything else um and her view of political campaigning was very influenced by what she knew of movie sets um so there's a lot of stuff in her work. So I tried to kind of think about like Joan Didion in Hollywood, but also Hollywood in Joan Didion's work, whether or not she was working in the movies. And so the book is kind of a narrative of her life, but also of Hollywood and American politics. That's cool. I didn't know any of that. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know anything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, a lot of people don't, you know, a lot of people encounter yeah. Didion as the writer of a couple different pieces, but yeah. for it's very rich and interesting stuff. She also was a film critic, I should say, I guess here. Oh, um, is she? Yeah, in her, um, so when she was probably, I guess, in her late 20s, early 30s, she uh, wrote a film review column for Vogue for several years. And she briefly shared that column with Pauline Kael before Pauline Kael became the great New Yorker oh, film wow. critic. Um, yeah. So... And they, they kind of were frenemies their whole lives and oh, sniped really? at each other. And so there's a lot of interesting <laughs> lore to be, to be combed over. Huh, interesting. I'll look mm -hmm. forward to reading it. That's next year? Yeah. That's cool. next year on March 11th, the week after the Oscars. <laughs> well, you have another book called Salty about women mm -hmm. and food and writing about mm -hmm. food. And so I yeah. must like food movies. I do. Yeah, I do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I wish I had had more food movies in that book, although I, I still I think probably I will almost inevitably end up writing a food movie book at some point. But yeah, uh -huh. I mean, Babette's Feast. Yes. Or, um, you know, Big Night or uh, yeah, Eddie Julie and, and Julia. Julie and Julia. And then last year, The Taste of Things, which I think is mm -hmm. actually one of the best food movies I've ever seen. I love that. Um, such a great film. And so, I mean, I watched it a bunch because I wrote a bunch of different pieces about it. And it just really has, you know, the first scene is long and it's just cooking a meal, just people cooking a meal. And you don't know who these people are, what their relationship to one another is. Yeah. And, it really um, is about 20 minutes of just food prep. But, it is. <laughs> it it is. Yeah. Like In a it. French kitchen. Yeah. It's just yeah. really, really phenomenal. So <laughs> yeah, I mean, I have no, I have like no formal culinary training, but I'm a very, very avid home cook and mm. I've always really enjoyed writing about food and thinking about you have it. Your, um, your, your specialty dish that, that, uh, you know, you can nail. Gosh. Uh, I mean, I, I modestly am very good at many things. Yesterday I was feeling a little, I was just feeling a little bummed out at the end of a very busy week. And I was okay. like, how can I feel better? I'm going to go cook. So I went over to the grocery store and I came home with a, um, a roast, which I braised with some, you know, red wine and mushrooms and carrots mm -hmm. for, uh, for like three hours. And then I also made a big pot of chicken noodle soup. Well, just chicken soup, I guess. Yeah. Um, because you know here we are it's but in sort of the french way where you brown the chicken first and then deglaze it and it's very good yeah so I, mean, I just it's I, hard yeah. in, in new york though to like i mean have <laughs> not any space to cook and yeah my yeah, kitchen's pretty tight. good sized yeah uh -huh. i have a i have a pretty decently sized kitchen um 
<laughs> well, I mean, it wouldn't be a decently sized kitchen by anyone else's standards, yeah. but <laughs> by, by New York you standards, yeah. it feels big. Yeah. But no, I, I, even when I was, um, very young, like 21, 22, and was living in a studio apartment, uh, would always cook meals for huge numbers of people. And we would just like sit on the floor and eat lentil stew and fresh bread or whatever, because mm-hmm. I just, I enjoy that form of creating pretty much more than any other or maybe even more than writing, although I don't think I'd want to work in a restaurant kitchen. <laughs> yeah. Well, if there if there are two of you uh, covering the film, uh, be it the, mm-hmm. the Times, how do you decide who gets to uh, write on what movies? Yeah. Well, um, Manola is a chief critic, so she, you know, picks first, basically. Mm. So um, we get a list pretty much. Yeah. Every week we get a list from um, the editorial what do we call them? The news assistant on the desk mm. um, who's put together a list of the movies that are coming out in roughly a month. And usually like we kind of know already, but um, there's always, you know, like 15 movies on that list. And Manol will pick two that she wants to write about. And then I pick two that I want to write about. And I also write a little documentary column that comes out every week, which is like a small low lift, but just trying to spotlight documentaries that might otherwise not get um, recognition mm-hmm. for whatever reason. That's been extremely popular, which is ah. very gratifying. Um, and so, and then, you know, the rest goes to the editors and they decide which ones they want to cover and um, which freelance writers will be reviewing them. And we have kind of a stable of freelancers who we use. Cause of course, one of the things that you want when you are publishing reviews regularly is kind of dependable voices where a reader can follow that critic over time and that's they know they either like or don't like this person's taste but at least they have something to rely on so that's pretty much it and then on top of it you know we have notebooks that will write if you know a movie's coming out and there's something to say about it that isn't actually a review Mm -hmm. um, or maybe a series of movies or a trend or someone dies and we want to write an appreciation of them or and then you know we get to the end of the year and we have top 10 lists and Oscar Mm -hmm. season stuff and all of that but the the basic format is just like you know we try to we try to make sure we're both writing about things that we either have strong feelings about or that we think our audience will have strong feelings about um, so that they know to rely on our thousand word pieces and then the freelance pieces are usually a little shorter Mm -hmm. so you've been covering new york film festival uh, Mm -hmm. and i was i have to admit i was super disappointed i didn't get in this year i'd gotten the past past three years and Mm -hmm. uh, i was really surprised but uh so i'm curious what are some of the highlights so far uh, that you've seen yeah um i've seen a lot of the festival they kind of front-loaded it um and boy, there's a lot of good stuff. <laughs> Honestly, it's been a really good year. I I really enjoyed Nickel Boys, which uh, opened the festival oh, yeah. I heard that's a couple good. nights ago. Um, it's very unlike what people are going to be expecting, I think. Uh, but I knew, um, you know, Ramel Ross, the director, his his documentary Hale County was one of the most important docs I think ever. So uh, it was great to see him apply that lens to fiction but I've been seeing a lot of great documentary there's actually several very 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 long documentaries um in the festival that are split into parts obviously uh one of them is the the uh Chinese director Wang Bing has a the last two installments of his series called Youth which uh is like an observational film about young people mostly in their 20s working in basically the factories that turn out fast fashion um, Mm -hmm. in China and it's not really about that it's about their lives and um, the second one which is the first one that's playing is um, called Hard Times is about uh, efforts to organize labor for instance in these factories where they're often kind of exploited by their bosses so it's a really good series then there's a 14-hour documentary about um documenta which is a every five year art show that happens in europe uh it's probably the most important art show in the world uh and yes so it's 14 hours long (laughs) in 14 episodes and it is absolutely gripping it's just so good 
I haven't seen the whole thing. Um, mm-hmm. They showed some of it in the theater and then sent the rest out because, you know, they can't give up mm-hmm. a theater for that long. But they are screening it in the theaters. Um, I believe one time they're screening it over two days and one day they're screening it over three. But it is it was phenomenal. Um, and then there is a really, really, really good series series kind of I guess five parts um it will eventually be 10 but the last five are still in production but the um director Julia Loctev made a film called My Undesirable Friends which is sort of a um she she went to Moscow intending to make a documentary about a friend of hers who was working for kind of a dissident television station there uh and it turned out that the war broke out like within two months of her getting there. And so it, it became a film about a group of women dissident journalists in Moscow who are being kind of actively disenfranchised and then pursued by the government. Um, it's just very, very good. That's I've never seen know, anything like it. It's when you know a documentary is a good documentary when the, when the, the director allows the, the message and the, yes. the story to change by what mm-hmm. she sees uh, yes. and then you know okay this is authentic this is not you that's know, right and yeah then, yeah it's unfolding it's not contrived yeah. and yeah mm-hmm. it's just really tremendous and also I think you know sometimes it's hard to imagine how <clears throat> you can reach a place in a country where all your journalists are yeah. fleeing the country and the the film really does a good job of showing how it's sort of you know death by a thousand cuts it's very very good yeah yeah I, I wish I knew the name but when I was in college I watched a documentary about it was all about veiling in the Middle East mm. and uh, and what I thought was impressive was the the director so she's interviewing this who she thinks is this very like modern woman mm-hmm. and this is way way back in uh it was in i graduated in 2002 so this was a long time but anyway and she's interviewing this very modern woman and she shows the picture of the fully you know the fully uh, veiled woman and uh and this modern woman says oh i admire her so much and and I just thought that that was like such an authentic yeah. moment for the director yep. to include that because she was expecting this woman to be uh, yeah. to not say that, and yes. uh, and yep. it makes everything more interesting when when it captures that that response. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, I I feel like that's all. I one of my I, I did a master's degree in um, creative nonfiction writing, and it was really mm-hmm. interesting to me when I started writing more seriously about documentary that there's so much of the same set of questions that documentary makers who are really uh serious about the craft and not just about sort of creating an article in video form Mm -hmm. um there's so much that is the same that people who write memoir or narrative long-form reporting are thinking about yeah but it's been a pretty good year for documentaries i mean i just saw the christopher reed one and I thought mm-hmm. it was so well done. I really, yeah. really, really liked that. And then uh, the greatest nine pop. Oh yes, right, have you yep. seen that? Yep, that was, was really. Was that good. this year? Wow. Yeah, yeah, I guess it was this year. <laughs> yeah, crazy. I it's think one of the best year. ones I've seen um, is "Look Into My Eyes," um, oh, which I is Lana that. Wilson's talk about psychics in New York City. Um, I it it's was sort of released and it'll stream um but a24 actually released it um recently and it's you know you think it's going to be one thing and then it's totally something else and that's Mm -hmm. usually the mark of a good doc yeah yeah uh what about the rest of this year for movies how do you feel do you feel like it's been a good year or yeah i mean it's hard when you're comparing it to last year which was so good that it sort of was like um you know kind of uh, yeah it was, I've been a um, I've been a grump. I have already lived <laughs> when it comes to the I, mainstream I, releases. It's been rough. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I never. I'm rarely thinking about mainstream releases when I'm thinking about like the good movies yeah. from the year. Although there's been some good ones. I I really liked the last new Dune year we were so movie. spoiled with Barbie. Yes, last, and but Oppenheimer. last year was a real. That was a real risk. Somebody took a risk, and that's what yeah. happened. Um, you know, but but there's been a lot of good movies this year and there are a lot of good movies coming um if the fall festivals are any indication uh, i think most uh, looking forward to 
Well, I've seen almost everything, but I am looking forward to seeing uh, the Nosferatu movie that mm-hmm. Robert Eggers has mm-hmm. made. I think that's going to be a hoot, at least. Um, and I always appreciate him and his his like commitment to doing the weirdest possible thing at every <laughs> given moment. That that makes me very happy. Um, and there, you know, I. I've seen, yeah, I have seen most stuff, but like I saw The Brutalist last week and it was, I was, I went in skeptical and I came out converted. I thought it was very, very good and would see it again. And um, there's always stuff like that that's kind of slipping in along the edges. So, and I'm, you know, I'm curious to see, for instance, if the Bob Dylan um, Mm -hmm. biopic is any good. It could be. (laughs) One always holds out hope. um, Yeah. What do you you think about Wicked? Do you think it looks good? How do you feel? I don't have any feelings about Wicked because I just don't uh, have any feelings about the show. Okay. Uh, I've never seen it. Uh, oh, but, you know, I don't know. I mean, it's kind of one of those, you know, you. I see most Broadway stuff every season. But when someone's something's been running that long, it's yeah, you just never get around to. I've <laughs> never seen the Lion King either <laughs> for the same reason. Oh. <laughs> but I'm I am curious to see it. I think uh there's some talent in there that makes me think it might be good. And I've been hearing advanced things that yeah. intrigue me. So you never know. Yeah, I'm hopeful. I mean, I'm the biggest softie when it comes to musicals because I yeah. love theater and I love, um, mm-hmm. and I just, I, I like musicals that hardly anybody else likes, yeah. but, uh, but so I'll probably like it, but I wish they were yeah. get into two parts. I think it's a mistake. I, yeah. I, I mean, we'll like, see. Does that show the second act is it, it's just a very top heavy show like most yeah. of the good songs are in that first act and yeah well uh, so they, I'm like, how are you gonna have an entire movie after defying gravity like it just doesn't commercially, make sense though, commercially it's a it proves to be a yeah. smart move i mean yeah. that's what that's what we're here for <laughs> i mean and i guess we'll they're see. gonna bring in more of the book which i have never read so that'll mm-hmm. that'll be interesting but, mm-hmm. uh, but yeah, I mean, I'm I'm trying to be hopeful uh, that you know that it'll be good. Yeah, I, I mean, in the you know, so much that John Chu did. I really yeah, a great movie. I I think you know my opinion is that you should never decide something will be good or bad before you get mm-hmm. there. And oh then, no, you know, often I, it is. <laughs> yeah, like you can't help but have be influenced at least a little bit by the marketing. But yeah, once mm-hmm. you sit in that chair, you should give everything as much a fair shot as you yes. can. And I very I strictly do not watch trailers. Oh. I don't watch trailers. I think that actually it is bad. There, are, I wrote something about this for Vox last year, but I mm-hmm. think most trailers are not selling the movie that the movie is. They're selling the movie that they think will get people to buy yeah. a ticket. And they've gotten increasingly divorced from the film, but also... Well, I yeah, I mean, I like, think... even with Wicked, they haven't shown a single character sing yet. Not one. Mm-hmm. In any right. of the yeah. <laughs> Which is how musical oh, trailers go at this point. But, but you I would think... just think Wicked would be the exception. Like, it's so a musical, you know. Like, I get it yeah. for Wonka or for, you know, something else, but it's, uh, it's yeah. bonkers. But, uh, yeah. Well, I just, what I doing, think, like, I mean... yeah, I, you know, as a critic, I don't need to be marketed to because I yeah. have to be there one way or another and it does feel like a lot of the discourse centers around marketing instead of around the actual thing itself um so i just i just don't believe in them at all (laughs) that's i can see that uh well i noticed that you had an article on your site that said if disney if disney is a language do we still speak it what do you mean Mm -hmm. by that disney so this was an article that i wrote um actually right after I got to the times, which is kind of funny, but uh, it was for the hundredth anniversary of Disney. And I was thinking about how Disney as a company really has formed a kind of vocabulary uh, for understanding the world for like generations of people, whether it's, you know, Mickey Mouse or, you know, the movies of the nineties that I grew up with or all the properties that they own now, which includes like Star Wars and Pixar. These are all kind of cultural vocabularies for people. And one thing that has happened recently is they faltered, which is something that Bob Iger has talked about. And they, the company clearly has 
started to think about. Um, but it's partly because they were turning out too much stuff. I mean, the Marvel universe just got over bloated and people Disney couldn't, Plus. couldn't follow it anymore. And, yep. um, but you know, it also occurred to me as a, as a child of the nineties and that Renaissance of Disney that, you know, you knew when people said the new Disney movie, you knew what they meant, you know, and it was an event every year when the new one came out and you had like bed sheets with the characters on them. And there was more of a, a monoculture at the time, just generally, but also Disney was a big part of that. And that goes back for generations when Disney was kind of the only game in town. Um, and so the question I wanted to think about, and it's sort of a thought experiment is like, if Disney loses its grip on that, then you know where is that common shared vocabulary anymore in a world that's increasingly fragmented so that's kind of what I was thinking about it it a little bit is tied to just knowing that like Disney characters have been used around the world for instance to teach English as a second language to the children in China or whatever um and if those characters lose their grip on people's imaginations then disney you know changes at least its place in the in the culture and that is true of disney in a way it's true for basically no other studio there's like mm -hmm. been a very strong coherence to disney over a century um and a you know excellent um knows for how to bring people into the fold and make them really committed to disney as like structuring their imagination completely and that is, you know, that is at risk if yeah. you dilute the pot too much. So, yeah, so it was an interesting piece to write. And um, it's sort of speculative. You know, I have no idea. And obviously, Iger, I believe just weeks before I had written it, had um, been at a New York Times event where he had been talking about the brand and trying to sort of bring it back in line with his vision of it. But he won't be there forever. Um who knows what the future holds, but it's, yeah. it's very interesting to think about. I mean, I, I have a whole section on my podcast, podcast talking Disney. I, mm -hmm. I, I love, you know, I love animation and I love so many yeah. of the films uh, and they've always been kind of cyclical. They'll have yes. their, their, their dark times and then the Renaissance and yes. then another dark time and then another Renaissance revival and it, yeah, kind, of, it right. kind of cycles, but I feel like we're needing that revival to happen. I mean, this is a pretty right. long, this is a pretty yes. long downtime that they've had. And, and it's not just usually when they've had a downtime, they've had like in the two thousands, yeah, they had Pixar that was, it was doing right. great, you know? And, right. and, and right now, I mean, although they did have a surprisingly good year this year, no, <laughs> yeah. I don't think anybody expected, but even the parks are kind of struggling right now. Yep. So it's just a, it's 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 a very weird time and you just, is. who is gonna what idea what um you know because the other interesting thing is that for years disney because of the failure of sleeping beauty they thought yeah. that the girls movies didn't sell which, right right but um yeah which is, it would but it's it's so fascinating because like cinderella is the movie that got them out of the wartime you know slump and then of course little mermaid was their hail mary in the yeah. 80s and you know brought on this whole renaissance and then frozen you know in the, yep. in the and and so you know what is yeah. going to be that that movie what is right going to be and that thing? well i think the more pressing problem for them maybe i don't know it sounds like Iger is kind of understanding this but even when you had those movies they were still uh dominantly theatrical environment where it was yeah. like you would go to see the movie and that makes an event out of it and now yes of course children then watch it three billion times drive their parents crazy yeah. at home but there was that kind of eventizing of it and whatever the next thing is has to enter a culture in which um that's a question you know and that's a question that the studio gets to decide if they want to pursue it and certainly a studio like netflix is like pretty much anti-theatrical um disney is trying to I, I you know i think they kind of have within the company the ability to save or destroy theatrical distribution but that's a choice they have not um committed to mm. yet mm. and they also additionally have very restrictive contracts with theaters and so 
um, yeah. they can be a big problem for theater chains too. So there's just a lot of stuff there. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. Are you a fan of Rachel's reviews? Do you look forward to family movie night, female film critics panels, or the talking Disney podcast? If so, please consider supporting the podcast by becoming a patron. As a patron, you get to access monthly events such as the watch alongs and Q and A's where you get to talk to stars and find out the behind the scenes of the movie making industry. And you can pick what I review for family movie night, or even become a guest on the podcast Podcasts and YouTube channels are expensive and I really, really could use your help. I would so appreciate it. You also get to be a member of the Facebook group where we talk about all the films that we're seeing and we have so much fun. Go to patreon.com slash hallmarkies and select one of the Rachel's fan tiers. That's patreon.com slash hallmarkies. This time you must have had some unpopular opinions. The, oh yeah. I mean, yeah, the, of course. And, and what is that experience like? Uh, Cause <laughs> I always find it incredibly surreal. It, it's just so, a, especially yeah, if it's I mean, one of the main properties. You know, it's not like it used to be. It's funny. Um, uh, when Twitter in particular was more active uh, with like normal people doing normal things, yeah. um, that it was a much bigger deal when you had a negative opinion kind of like went viral for it. That doesn't quite exist the same way anymore. But I will say... Well, two things. One is the Times has obviously an enormous reader base. We're like over 10 million subscribers around the world. Um, they're reading on paper. They're reading on the web. So I don't really always know where people are coming from. Um, and they email more. And they also email more to just say, I like what you wrote, <laughs> mm. which is not honestly a thing that I was totally used to. And a lot of them are older people who like to just send a note and say like you know I didn't like this movie but I like what you wrote about it or something that, like that that's nice. which is really lovely um, yeah. especially <laughs> because over the course of my career I've definitely had experiences working at other places where that was not true and I would get like really nasty mail um, I still get some of that but it just it doesn't really bug me because I just yeah. figure if someone's you know it's not about me obviously if someone like took time out of their day to sit down and write a nasty email to a stranger but also um i have found this is perhaps the funniest thing people are astonished when i reply to those emails or any emails they just yeah. are astonished that someone's reading the email which has really made me think a lot about what people are doing when they sit down and write a nasty email to a stranger like if they don't think that person's going to read it, why did they do it in the first place? And I guess some of it's just like people have a lot of feelings and this is how they get them out. So it's been kind of funny. Um, but we also haven't had really a movie that's as or I haven't reviewed a movie that's as divisive as like, um, you know, like when the Ghostbusters reboot came out years ago, that was like a big deal. We haven't had anything like that this year yet but I'm sure we will. Um, <laughs> and sometimes I get people who are just like, how dare you lie to us about this being good? And I'm like, oh no, that's no, this is art. See the way art works is some people like it and some people don't. Um, but you know, thanks for reading. I don't know. There, the funny thing that happens of course on the internet is that a click uh, is the same, whether you love or hate what's behind it. Yeah. So yeah. No, no well, skin and off my and yeah, and and I think that if you are consistent enough and and that people know that you're not like you're not shilling, you're not, you know, you're yeah, that that I think in the end it does it, by in the end they do end up respecting you, at least that's my hope. Yeah. Um Yeah, well but... and I try to <laughs> I try to reply in part because you know, it doesn't bug me at all, honestly. Like it mm -hmm. I it doesn't bug me, but it and there's definitely misogyny that comes into it. Um, yeah. But I think that sometimes replying and saying like, hi, like this wasn't really necessary, but like, you know, thanks for reading anyhow. Sometimes I think can help people like remember or Humanize. snap out of this yeah. weird like internet thing we have where we think people on the internet aren't real. Yeah. And, you know, we are well, we're all people. Sometimes it can be so random. Like 
I, uh, I have a blind spot series on my site where every month mm-hmm. I review a movie classic of some kind that I hadn't seen. Yeah. And I try to mix it up and have some like cult classics and some you know, more mm-hmm. mainstream, just a variety. And, uh, and I've been doing it for a long time. And I did a review of Barry Lyndon, this is Stanley Cooper, that I was like, I, I can see why people love it. I don't dislike it. I just didn't like love it, you know, and, yeah. and uh, mm-hmm. it was just, it just didn't move me. It didn't inspire me. It kind of left me a little cold. And, yep. uh, and so I, I still gave it a positive on like Ron Tomatoes, whatever. And yeah. I had gotten the most like upset yeah. people about this story. <laughs> I know, I, just, I like, know. I and no you idea can... there was like a Barry Lyndon hive, but like the Cooper oh, hive, like hugely. <laughs> yes. No. I, yeah. There's a handful of those things where you really have to. I was saying to my editor, and I may still do this. I have a idea for a piece that um, is not about love, actually, but would be pegged to the anniversary of love, actually. Yeah. And she was like, do you really want to step on that behind? <laughs> I was like, yeah, I think I do. I mean, I'm fine with it. But yeah, there's just, you know, people have a lot of opinions, but also you can tell when, or I, I don't know if you can, I can tell when something I've written has suddenly been posted to like a Reddit yeah. of fans or something like that. And yeah. you get a, you get a whole influx of email and you just kind of have to. A lot of those end up blocking because it's just not worth yeah. it. But like, yeah, it's, it's like not... a real if it's a real comment with like some thought put into it, then yes. I try to reply because I feel like, you know, among other things, trust in media is at an all time low. And I'm sure there's a lot of people who still think I get paid by the students, which I mean, that sounds great, but no, I do not. Um, (laughs) But, uh, but, you know, replying reminds people like, Oh no, actually real people are doing this. This isn't like some, especially in a, in the mounting age of AI, like who even knows. So Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I saw it, it looked like last year you were a big zone of interest fan I did I did love yeah. that yeah yeah I thought yeah. that one was pretty remarkable it was a very unique film yes yeah mm-hmm. so I saw that um at Cannes uh and you know nobody had seen it and it was just a, actually it was a crazy day I saw that uh and Pillars of the Flower Moon and May, December, all in like a 24 hour oh, period. Wow. So my brain was just exploding. But the zone of interest um, is exactly my kind of film where it's like quite cerebral and really playing with the tools of filmmaking to like make you feel the story rather than just like straightforwardly. You know, as soon as I kind of figured out what he was doing, I was astounded that he had even done it. Um, and that always excites me when that happens um yeah yeah. but you know that was one that um Manola and I completely disagreed on but that's one of the fun things about having two critics yeah you know pretty different tastes even though in many respects we are similar people um because we can come at it from different directions and that's really we were just talking about how fun it is when people disagree with one another about a movie because then we have a conversation yeah absolutely once i always say that like being a movie fan is 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 the the, one of the best parts about being a movie fan is you always have something to talk about with anybody yeah yeah exactly almost everybody has at least one movie that they love yes and that they want to talk about so if you can find out what that is and you can just chat about it like you can yes absolutely and i also have long maintained that talking learning to talk about movies with people who you disagree with um in this extremely divided world that we live in is actually great because the stakes let's face it are pretty low like if you like yeah zone of interest or don't i mean you know we're not talking about like things that affect people's material conditions of their life or something like that you know it's just it's just a movie at the end of the day so it's a good way to practice having a conversation with someone where you just never are going to see eye to eye but you can kind of learn to see how they're seeing something i think movies are really good good for that yeah that's very, very true well, we like to end our interviews with some fun get to know you rapid fire questions. So excellent. First one is what is the best ice cream flavor? Oh, um uh pain, uh, uh chocolate chip cookie dough. Okay, good. Yes. What's your I favorite color? <laughs> uh gosh, it depends on right now I find myself buying a lot of rust colored things, but I think it's because it's fall. fall. Yeah, for <laughs> yes. fall. Uh what music are you into? 
Um, <laughs> I have terrible taste in music and pretty much only listen to music that I um, listened to in college. But, uh, but you know, I, I will listen to anything. And my husband is a big, um, he loves minimalist classical music and he's always sending me playlists. So I listen oh. to a lot of that now. Okay, yeah. Good. All right. What is your go-to date night food? Ooh, um, so there is a restaurant down the street from my house that is Italian, but it's like Roman Italian and they make a, um, like a popper deli with beef cheeks in it or something like that. Mm-hmm. It's like the best food ever. So whenever we can go there, I, I agitate. That's the go. best part about living in New York city is not only oh, do man. they have the best food in the world, but that you can get it delivered at any hour. <laughs> that is very, very true. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What is your go-to date night activity if you're going out doing something? Um, you're gonna laugh. But usually we go to the movies <laughs> because well, we- again, New York City, there's like some great classic yeah. that you've never seen playing on like 70 millimeters, uh, six blocks from where you are. So yeah, yeah that would be so you know, cool. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty great. I but I always say that it's it means it's different when you're married and everything, but like. For a date date, it's yeah. best to go to the movie and then dinner as yes. opposed to dinner in the movie. Cause then you can talk that about is movie correct. at dinner. hundred percent. I completely yeah. agree. Yeah. 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 And if you can go to a matinee and yes. then dinner, cause yeah, you know, that's, that's the best time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I wish there were more movies at like six, in the six o'clock hour. I know it's very They're almost always like earlier, like four and then like at seven, Eight. but yep. cause and, and then like nine is way too late and seven's kind of early. If you have to rush through dinner, if you're doing dinner first, yep. it's like, yep. oh, it's, it's, I it's, completely agree. It would be perfect. And then you could get done in time yep. to like have an eight o'clock dinner. And it would be- yes, I mean, I, I do appreciate the innovation of the, um, like Metrograph in New York, for instance, is a theater that ha- a very cool theater that has like two screens oh, yeah. but then they have like a michelin restaurant in yeah. the building and so you can just like even go get a drink afterwards yeah. and enjoy that yeah or like alma draft house yes is, uh, yeah that is nice the way they do that and uh, yeah and, and, and then go have I, a drink after yeah yeah because i have gone to <laughs> south by southwest last two years and uh so mm. that's been really fun there uh, all mm-hmm. right uh which do you like better dogs or cats Oh, I'm definitely a cat person, although I am more allergic to cats than dogs. <laughs> uh, which do you like better, beaches or mountains? Oh, um, beach person, for sure. Okay. What's your favorite holiday to celebrate? Uh, New Year's, but maybe Thanksgiving. Definitely one of those. It, it sort of goes by the year. Last year, I was moving around New Year's, so that wasn't so much fun. Um, but, of course, Thanksgiving, I get to cook. So, you know. Yeah. That's, uh-huh. that's good. Yeah. Built in well, long weekend. <laughs> and th- this last one comes from, I, you know, I'm the host of the Hallmarkies podcast. And so mm-hmm. this is where this comes from. It's your, what's your favorite romantic movie? Oh boy. Ah, uh, I, there's a lot. This is why I'm, I mean, <laughs> hmm. there, the one that, I mean, I've, of course, everybody loves you've got mail, even though it's, incredibly problematic by the end I when you really it. think about it but it's such a lovely movie but um, Nora's script this... is so good in that you know and yeah. I just love the perfumery story where the shop around mm-hmm. the corner you've got the whole idea of, of people falling in love over their words yes. and they don't like each other in real life yes. it's just a romantic idea although I have a better answer and my answer is Titanic <laughs> Ah, okay, which I good. actually yeah. put on my when I did the sight and sound ballad a couple of years ago I put that on as one of the best good. 10 best movies ever made because I feel like it is the epitome of a good Hollywood movie yeah. so <laughs> I agree I agree also sad but yeah <laughs> well very good you did it you answered all the questions yeah so. oh well good Thank I love, you a, so love a rapid tyrant yeah of course I'm glad <laughs> glad this worked out yeah it's thank you so much chat. for for doing this this was a blast it was so cool and honored to get to talk with you and uh hopefully we keep in touch and hear what you think about yeah. all these movies coming out in the in the in the next couple months uh yeah you know where to find me <laughs> yeah if people want to follow you on socials and stuff like how do they do that yeah um i i 
sweet a little or whatever it's called now um at Alyssa marie which is my middle name all the other socials i'm on as Alyssa wilkinson okay um great and i'm not i'm i'm not like super active on any of them but i do tend to post whatever i'm working on so that'll that'll be out there and of course you can find me in the new york times great We'd like to take a second and thank our sponsor for this episode of the podcast. It's the Hallmarkies Merch Store. Are you looking for that perfect gift for the postable, hardy, or Hallmarky in your life? What about getting that t-shirt or hoodie that will help you stand out at your next holiday party? Now is the time to check out the Hallmarkies Merch Store. Full of festive designs by artists like Jessica Miller, Carrie from Hallmark Comics, and more. You can even have more than just shirts, but totes, cell phone cases, notebooks, mugs, and more. And it isn't just Hallmark. We have designs for Anna Green Gables, Man from Snowy River, The Nanny, and more. Every purchase at the merch store goes to help support the podcast and allows us to make the great content you know and love. There are frequent sales, so go to tpublic.com slash stores slash Hallmarkies or see the link in the description. That's tpublic.com slash stores slash Hallmarkies. I'd like to thank Alyssa for coming on the podcast. This was so much fun to get to talk with her. I feel so inspired by her story and how she was able to uh, use these freelancing opportunities to become a critic of the New York times. That's just incredible. Uh, So I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Let me know what you think about all the things that we talked about. And uh, please, if you are listening on iTunes, please uh, leave your ratings and reviews. Really appreciate that. And uh, you can find me at Rachel's Reviews, all of our social media, iTunes, YouTube, and on Rotten Tomatoes. And and follow the Hallmarkies podcast all over the place. Make sure you do that. If you are watching on YouTube, please give the video a thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel. We appreciate that so much. And we also have the patron group and merch store. Check that out. And thanks again to Alyssa. Really appreciate it. And we'll talk to you later.